May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be always acceptable unto thee, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. In a commentary on this morning's gospel lesson, the Reverend John Claypool relates that he once what he, that he once asked a Jewish friend why people of his faith so often answer a question by asking a question. His friend responded with a wry smile, why not? <laughs> with that in mind, I guess one could say that Jesus is being very Jewish in our gospel lesson for today. We are told a lawyer puts Jesus to a test by asking the question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Good Jewish rabbi that he is, Jesus responds with a question. In fact, a couple of questions. What is written in the law and how do you read? In other words, what does the Torah literally say and how do you interpret that? Again, being a good Jewish rabbi, Jesus knew that scripture can be interpreted more than one way, and frequently is. In this little cat and mouse game, the lawyer answers only the first question by reciting from the Torah. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. Jesus responds by telling the lawyer that he has basically answered his own question, and quite correctly. Now all the man has to do is live out these words. Now is the lawyer satisfied with our Lord's answer? Well, no. You see, he wanted to put Jesus on the spot trip him up. Obviously thinking in terms of the old adage, the devils and the details, he tries to pin Jesus down by having him define just exactly who qualifies as a neighbor. This was quite a matter of debate in Jewish circles, and perhaps not surprisingly, the tendency was to highly restrict the definition of neighbor. Think of it as human nature 101. It's kind of like when you haul all your yearly financial records to your tax accountant. You do not want him to tell you what is the highest possible amount of money you can pay in taxes. You want him or her to tell you how you can reduce your taxable income so that you can legally get by with paying as little as possible. I think it is pretty safe to assume that this lawyer wanted Jesus to provide him with the most narrow definition of the word neighbor. Well, as we see, Jesus does not give the lawyer a direct answer. Instead, he tells the lawyer a story. A story we know as the parable of the Good Samaritan. What we do not always keep in mind is that for a Jewish person like the lawyer, the term Good Samaritan was basically an oxymoron. There was really no such thing as a Good Samaritan. A Samaritan could well be a villain in a Jewish story, but not a hero. Telling a Jewish audience of that day the parable of the Good Samaritan would be kind of like telling a group of Holocaust survivors the parable of the good Nazi. Be that as it may, the story. A man, presumably a Jewish man, was going from Jerusalem down to Jericho. A very dangerous journey in that day and time. In fact, I understand it still can be. And so it happens that some thieves attack and overpower him beat him to a pulp and leave him for dead. We are told that both a priest and a Levite saw this man lying half dead in the road, but each of them decided to pass by on the other side. 
We are not told why. That is obviously not the point of the story. In any case, Jesus says that a Samaritan comes along and he is moved with pity. So much so that out of his great compassion, he makes all of his resources available to this man. Seemingly, the Samaritan said to himself, I don't care how much time it takes or how much it will cost me. I am going to do everything I possibly can to help this man. Jesus then turns to the lawyer and asks him yet another question. Which of the three proved neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? The lawyer's response, the one who showed mercy on him. To which Jesus says, go and do likewise. This is, of course, a very familiar parable. In fact, it is so familiar, one can miss an intriguing little nuance, one that I think can be more important than we realize. That nuance is that Jesus did not ask the lawyer which of the three truly loved or showed compassion to his neighbor, what one might expect. <laughs> Instead, the question was posed in this way, which of the three proved a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers. In other words, the neighbor is defined in this parable as the, not as the object of compassion, but as the agent of compassion. Interesting. Thus, we can not only prove beneficial to others when we see them and love them as our neighbors, they can prove neighbors to us as well by providing what we need. Like I am sure is true with a lot, if not all priests, I received newsletters from certain parishes I once served. The following comes from a newsletter from St. Paul's Episcopal Church in Athens, Tennessee. It was written by my successor as rector, Henry Harrison. It goes like this. I met a man from Texas in New Mexico last week. We ate lunch together one day at a large community table in our hotel dining room. He asked me what our church does that's exciting and impactful. And I told him that we had started a homeless shelter for men who are homeless for reasons related to addiction. He said, Oh, great, I am in recovery. He is an alcoholic, sober for nine years. He told me the following about himself. He's a businessman who travels all over the country for his job. He goes to 12-step meetings all over the place, but his favorite city to go to meetings is San Francisco. I ask him why. He said, well, Henry, here's the thing. I am a successful American, and I am pretty conservative. And to be honest, a little closed-minded. When I go to A meetings in San Francisco, I am pushed to the limits of my tolerance and patience. Why, I asked. Because, he said, out there, <laughs> I am around gay people, transgender people, black people and Latino people with this urban effect that I am not used to, women with bad attitudes, poor people, people whose lives I totally disagree with. You get the point. People not like me at all. And if there's one thing I need, it's to be more open-minded. I need to be more open-hearted and, well, peaceful. All those different people push me to open up my heart a little bit. It's good for me, he said. I want to open up. He smiled, then he said, 
So I keep going back. In the book of Proverbs, we are told that the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Obtaining wisdom as one moves through life is, I believe, very important. And one of the best ways I know how to achieve that is to be honest as possible with yourself. The businessman in the story I just shared is a man who one day looked at himself in the mirror and began to be truly honest about just who he was and what he needed. He found that being around people he was very uncomfortable with was exactly what he required to be the kind of man he wanted to be. And so he discovered that AA meetings in San Francisco provided the all sorts and conditions of men and women who can help him achieve his goal. <laughs> On those occasions, they become his neighbors. And as he said, they are good for him. We are to love our neighbors as ourselves, but it's important to keep in mind that we need what our neighbors can provide for us. Good neighbors do that. And good neighbors can come packaged in all sorts of ways. When we take a good, honest look at ourselves and admit that there are people in our lives that we tend to view as Samaritans, that is, people who we have trouble loving and respecting and feeling comfortable with, we need to really think about that. And with God's grace, to strive to change that. Amen.